have three excellent speakers who are presenting incredibly current work. Some of it, I think some of the findings might not be published for some of them yet. So it's a privy to see new things, but also I think it's research that is pushing at the boundaries and dealing with things that everybody talks about in terms of what service delivery needs to address, but maybe this will move us further forward in understanding the how and recognizing the, how the experience of living with long, multiple long-term conditions um, affects people's access to healthcare. So I'm Claire Goodman, I'm Professor of Healthcare Research, and I'm the theme lead for the NIHR, National Institute of Health Research and Care, um, theme for aging and multimorbidity at East of England, ARC, Applied Research Collaboration. And it's my delight to chair. So welcome everybody. We're going to have three presentations, one after the other. Um, we, if you have a question for clarification, do post it in the chat, but also please post your questions as they occur to you in the chat. We have somebody who will be collating the questions and at the end of the presentations, then hopefully we will be able to have something slightly more interactive where um, we can raise the questions that have been raised and invite the speakers to address them. And we may very well have uh, cross-cutting themes. Um, if everybody could mute themselves though, and as I say, use the chat um, for questions and or comments, um, that would be great. We are recording this and the slides, all the speakers are happy for their slides to be available. Um, and I think that is all the housekeeping. And so without any more delay, uh, really pleased to welcome as our first speaker, Dr. Jessica Rees. And Jess is presenting on her research done for her doctorate. Um, and you've been a PhD, you've got your doctorate, is it a month? Yeah, well, my Bible is the end of March, yes. Yeah. All so right, okay. So, minor amendments uh, oh, stand positive. So I'd like to welcome this experienced postdoc speaker um, who works with us on the um, ageing and multimorbidity theme and has and is currently working on a range of projects, um, including looking at how to support people using digital technology. Um, but today, Jess is going to talk about her doctorate. So I'm going to hand over to you. Yes. Thank you, Claire. Just checking that's okay visually for everybody. Can you see the screen? No? Not yet. Oh, okay. <laughs> How's that? It looks like it's coming. Yes. Yeah. Yes. We can see the slide and we can't see your notes. So that's good too. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Um, yeah, thank you everyone for coming. Um, as Claire said, um, yeah, I'm a research fellow working in the aging and multiple morbidity theme at the ARC, um, but today I'm going to be talking about the findings of my thesis, uh, which I recently completed at University College London. Um, and my thesis was all to do with how best we can support people with dementia to manage any other uh, multiple long-term conditions that they're living with. So my PhD was based on the fact that dementia rarely travels alone. Um, eight in every 10 people with dementia live with another long-term condition, um, for example, diabetes, um, stroke or asthma. Um, and the graph on screen is a um, analysis done by Public Health England, who compared the primary care records of people with dementia to an all patient group. So the people with dementia are represented in the red bar. And you can see that the majority of the time that is higher than the all patient group. So the prevalence of these long-term conditions was higher in people with dementia than not. And they also categorize different, um, the different long-term conditions. So things like diabetes or coronary heart disease are conditions that can increase the risk of dementia. And then conditions like depression and stroke are associated with dementia as well. So the NICE guidelines for dementia do have a section on assessing and managing other long-term conditions. And it says that we need to ensure that people living with dementia have equivalent access to diagnosis, treatment and care 
for services for comorbidities than people who do not have dementia. However, there is research to suggest this isn't the case with people with dementia ask, accessing fewer um, primary care contacts and physical health checks than people without dementia. The second bit of that sort of screenshot says that it's about signposting to other guidelines. So this sort of recognizes the challenge um, in that services are often designed around single conditions and thus they don't really reflect the difficulties or challenges or specific needs. And um, that might be the case when someone's also living with another long-term condition. So primary care is well placed to support the management of long-term um, conditions, but the presence of dementia complicates this healthcare delivery. And um, there has also been research done to suggest that healthcare professionals might like might lack the skills and confidence necessary to adapt those physical health care plans to the context of dementia. Um, but of course, interacting with your healthcare professionals is only a tiny bit about living with a long-term condition. So self-management being a daily task. And the symptom of dementia um, here also really impact a person's ability to self-manage, which requires over time support from other people who may be in their um, care network. So my PhD uh, wanted to look at how people with dementia manage or can be supported to manage any other long term conditions that they have in the community. So I'll just give a brief overview of the studies I did, then I'll talk about my sort of overall uh, findings. So um, the first study I did was a systematic review. So this was looking specifically at um, self-management. So looking at what the enabling or inhibiting factors to self-management might be for long-term conditions and dementia. So I identified 12 studies. Uh, these were mainly qualitative, although it was a mixed methods review. So there was some uh, quant in there too. Um, I developed four themes uh, from this um, review. Um, the majority of the studies I found focused on the perspective of the family carer. So what I did next was I did a secondary analysis of qualitative interviews that were collected as part of the NIDA study. So this is an ongoing trial happening at UCL um, new interventions for independence in dementia. Um, so they collected um, over 82 interviews of people with dementia, family carers, health and social care professionals and home care staff. And they were looking at um, enabling or inhibiting factors for independence at home and dementia. So I looked at these interviews to see what was the, um, how these stakeholders experienced and managed long-term conditions in dementia specifically. And I found three themes for that one. Um, because that was such a breadth of experience, the next study I wanted to do really wanted to focus in depth on how this management was happening in practice. Um, so I designed a um, qualitative study where I collected data from uh, multiple sources. So I did repeated interviews over um, four months, and then I triangulated those accounts with um, consultation notes and also event-based diaries that um, some people with dementia filled in. And I did this to understand how care for long-term conditions in dementia is provided and uh, supported in the community. Um, so overall, I had eight dementia care networks. That's what I um, called them. Um, and on screen is um, their pseudonyms and just a, a snapshot of some demographics to show that my sample had a range of different dementia types, um, people at different phases of dementia, and also different long term conditions as well. And I suppose just highlighting that these people weren't living with just one long term condition. You can see there's several as well, and all these had um, yeah different needs for the different stages. So because I did a qualitative approach for each of my um, each of my studies, I've just put the themes in the boxes there. Um, I integrated my findings to yeah try and summarize what the, what 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 this all means um, for dementia care. Um, so my systematic review and secondary analysis have been published if anyone wanted to read those themes in a bit more detail. And I'm about to submit my final qualitative study for publication as well. 
Um, so the first um, sort of topic that I wanted to discuss today was about this continuation, uh, continuum support. So the support for the management of long term conditions is existed on a continuum. Um, so the need for support increased over time as cognition might um, decrease or in response to different um, health needs. Um, so the first quote of this from a person with dementia who also had diabetes, um, just highlighting how independence in health management was really important for people with dementia in the early stages. Um, but over time, this had to be balanced with the need for care and treatment, um, specifically as yeah, cognition declined. So in this example, the person with dementia was experienced hypoglycemic faints and his consultation notes were showing sort of higher HbA1c levels, indicating that um, his diabetic control might not have been what it once was. Um, so the, the quote below um, is, is from another example um, where family carers then had to sort of monitor the adverse consequences if um, management ability changed. So in this example, the person with dementia was under investigation for heart failure. Um, and again, independence was very important to him, but the quote here suggesting how it's kind of that transition point between the family carer needing to intervene to ensure that the, his health is um, um, maintained, but also balancing that with the, with the need for independence as well. Um, I've, I've also found that sort of telephone consultations that were the primary um, method of communicating during the pandemic did make it harder for people with dementia, especially in the moderate to later stages, to be involved in healthcare. Because in my in my study, it tended to be the family the family carer that was mainly communicating with services. Um, so the second uh, topic and um, that living with multiple long term conditions required the management and prioritization of not only physical. Um, yeah, physical health needs, also cognitive, also mental health needs, but that these needs were interrelated and they changed over time, um, requiring care to be adapted in a holistic way. So the first quote just demonstrates um, how the, the symptoms of dementia impact a person's physical health, um, so their diabetes affecting their cognition and vice versa. Um, so highlighting that care in this context needs to um, consider the fundamental impact of dementia on the treatment for long-term conditions and yeah, vice versa. Um, so this, the second quote is all about um, how the family carers at times felt well supported by primary care to adapt um, different recommendations with changing needs. Um, but other times um, they experience a lack of integration at a service level. So this quote is from a family carer, um, a husband carer, his wife was in the later stages of dementia and they were having an annual review with the memory service. And he was reflecting on how um, he felt general practice focused on the medical problems, um, which in this case was things to do with frailty and swallowing difficulties, and that the behavioral challenges that they were also experiencing were more the responsibility of the memory service. But for this family carer, they were all happening at once. He didn't see them as siloed. For him, they all needed to be considered together. Um, and finally, in terms of mental health needs, um, because all these um, needs were happening at the same time, it seemed to lead to different trade-offs, um, creating like a hierarchy according to which conditions were being uh, prioritized. So it's I found that um, functional needs or things like falls, which had a safety concern, were often prioritized, um, whereas um, mental health needs um, took a much sort of lower um, priority. Um, so the final quote is related to a person with dementia and their experience of depression. Um, you can see they relate it to a physical health condition like arthritis. Um, but in his, in, in his other interviews, he sort of proactively managed lots of things to do with his physical health, like his inherited risk of glaucoma. Um, but he didn't mention his mental health at all to the GP um, because he sort of context, uh, conceptualized it as a symptom of dementia and sort of felt there was nothing to be done about it.
Um, the, and the final topic um, is around networks of care um, who supported the management of long term conditions of dementia and um, compensating for any difficulties with self management or communication difficulties. Um, so the family carer was positioned between health and social care professionals and the person with dementia, curating these supportive relationships to facilitate health care. Um, so the quote on screen from the neurologist there suggesting that the communication was very easy. Um, in this case, the family carer and the neurologist um, knew each other as the family carer um, volunteered previously in, in the research group. Um, but this led to yeah, improved communication. Um, and this was especially useful during the pandemic because um, in one case, an appointment was missed because of confusion around like in, when in-person um, consultations were to start again. So the person didn't go to the hospital, but the family carer was able to like rearrange the appointment and they did a video call that, that evening. Um, in terms of um, home care workers or involving social care, there was a, a, a slightly sort of different perspective. So some family carers expressing reluctance um, to involve home care workers due to the perception of additional burden of organising schedules or because of negative past experiences. Um, the quote at the, at, um, from a family carer there, again, this was another case of a husband carer looking after um, a person with dementia in the later stages. Um, it's sort of his reluctance to um, begin that support, yet how this sort of related to his own perceptions and his coping ability, so currently feeling able to manage himself. Um, and finally, the quote on top is just about how the family carer was such an integral part of the person with dementia's care that their needs, um, the needs and preferences of people with dementia and family carers often got um, entangled. Um, and this sort of had an influence on proxy decision making, especially in the later um, stages of dementia, where maybe the perspective of people with dementia weren't um, taken into account as much. Um, but the quote from the GP highlights how this was challenging for healthcare professionals, especially during um, dyadic health appointments, here saying how they wondered how much they were treating the carer rather than their, you know, the actual patient. Um, so. In terms of implications, um, my findings suggest that support for managing long term conditions and dementia should be holistic, flexible and considered networks of care. Um, and, but there was limited evidence of this sort of happening in practice. Um, so a flexible approach being required due to this dynamic nature of dementia care and um, to enable care to be adapted according to changing priorities. And also for sort of that continuous review to um, look at how dementia is impacting how a person can self-manage and how that's really important to facilitate um, the independence, which was really important for people in the early stages. Um, and then um, holistic for holistic management, that cognitive needs need to be sort of addressed in line with both physical and mental health needs because everything is interrelated in terms of presentation, but also impact. Um, but that dementia should be the organizing principle of care, which then everything else is sort of um, addressed in relation to because of the pervasive impact of dementia. Um, and then finally, in the context of dementia, the importance of acknowledging interdependencies with those who support care. So adopting this dyadic perspective um, in order to understand what are the support requirements of the family carer as well, um, to recognize the challenges that they also face when implementing this advice in the community. And um, so briefly in terms of what, what's um, next, um, like I said, my the findings of my third study are um, being going to, well, I'm going to submit it to a journal soon. Um, but I'd also like to um, share my experiences of, of the methodology I, I used. So um, the data collection for my third study was all done during COVID. Um, so I tried out lots of different uh, remote data collection methods uh, for um, people with dementia. Um, and also, again, because um, of the time frame, so my data was between September 2019 and May 2021. Um, and yeah, um, that, there was lots to do with the COVID pandemic. So again, um, in looking at that context specifically. 
Um, and then in terms of future research, um, the fact that, again, like my, all my studies were an in-depth sort of description of what it's like to manage long-term conditions in dementia. So again, like aligning with the ARC, an important thing for future research would be to implement those in practice or figure out sort of how to address that implementation gap between um, policy and practice. Um, so yeah, I'm planning to present my findings. Um, at the, there's, we have a, a dementia involvement group in Stevenage um, to think about um, yeah, how to implement these findings and um, yeah, looking specifically at the implications for people with dementia maybe who don't have those um, networks of care. Um, yeah, thank you. That's uh, my contact details on there. But um, yes, I'm sure I, can, I, can, I will answer any questions later. But I think if there's any clarifications, happy to answer them now. So I think you were obviously very clear because there aren't any questions in the chat for clarification. But uh, really exciting to see this because some of you will uh, know Francis Bunn's work that first started to map this. And this is the next stage. And I'm now get, that takes us into a segue very nicely into Professor Claire Sir's um, presentation. And Claire is professor at Leeds Beckett who um, have just done extremely well in their REF. So that's very good, professor of dementia studies. So you've heard Jess, who is definitely gonna be a future leader in dementia care research and delighted that we have Claire who is an established leader and is doing just some stunning work um, in hospital care and beyond. And uh, if any of you want to uh, get a quick short shortcut to everything you need to know about dementia care research, then I recommend just Googling Claire Sir and you'll probably get everything you need. Um, so we're delighted she's here, not to discount other great dementia care researchers, of course, but we are delighted you're with us. And uh, Claire, can I hand over to you? Please. Yeah, can you see my slides, Claire? Yes, we can. Excellent. So I've got, I can share now. So yeah, I'm going to talk to you about one of the studies that um, we completed um, just before the pandemic, actually, around um, oncology services for people with dementia. And we spent the period since then looking at how we can implement the findings in practice. Um, so I'll um, talk a little bit about that in the presentation as well. Um, so the, the study... Um, that we completed had two different um, components to it. So I'll briefly talk you through um, each study, but I'm going to focus more on the second study, which was our qualitative work in um, hospital settings. Um, but the first study, one of the challenges that we've got with cancer and dementia um, and understanding that as a, a sort of two long-term conditions is um, there was not much data around exactly how many people had both cancer and dementia in the literature um, and estimates varied massively um, across different papers, depending on the methods that people used. Um, so one of the things we wanted to find out in our exploratory study was really what does what's the size of this population um, and how do they compare to people with cancer alone and dementia alone in terms of some of their use of healthcare resources. Um, so the, we looked at um, a GP record set that we got from Research One database because that was the only place that we knew without trying to link multiple data sets um, that we could get data on both cancer and dementia through the quality outcomes framework um, registers. So it's, it's not perfect in terms of um, us being able to look at health resource use beyond really primary care, but it gave us a good starting point. Um, and so what we were able to pull from um, the research one data, the request was for everybody aged 50 and above with a diagnosis of cancer, a diagnosis of dementia or both conditions. And we were also given summarised data for the general population aged 50 and above. Um, so I'm just going to give you a, a brief summary of what our findings were. Um, when we looked at the age group of people aged 75 and above, what we found, and this is quite by chance that it's one in 13 for both populations, but if you look at if you've got people with cancer who are 75 and over, one in 13 of them will also have dementia. And the same if you look at um, people aged 75 and above with dementia, one in 13 will also have cancer. And this is likely to be an underestimate because of obviously the, um, the diagnosis rates for um, both of those conditions are not 100 percent. So this underestimates. So we've got quite a, a large number of people. Um, 
who are coming through oncology services who have both cancer and dementia. So that means it's a population that do need some particular consideration um, based on our data. We were able to pull out and look at types of cancer. Um, and what you can see is there's not a significantly um, massive difference between the different types of cancer that people have if they've got cancer only in that left hand bar or cancer and dementia in the right hand bar. You can see there's a few more people um, with prostate cancer um, and slightly um, bigger number with bladder cancer in the um, cancer and dementia, but they're fairly similar um, populations. Um, fitting in really nicely with Jess's presentation, we also looked at comorbidities, um, so other long-term conditions that people have got um, on top of either the cancer alone diagnosis, dementia alone, or both cancer and dementia. And what you can see, if you look at the, the blue, orange and green bars, so those people with two, three or four and more other long-term conditions is that people who've already got cancer and dementia, so they've already got two conditions, are much more likely than the other populations to also have other um, long-term conditions as well. So you can see there's something like 7% have four or more other conditions as well to be managing alongside. Um, and we're looking at nearly 40% that have at least two other um, conditions as well as these two big conditions. So these are quite a frail population who've got a number of other um, comorbidities. So that gave us a good starting point to say this is really a population worth looking at. And these have um, do look differently in terms of, of people's needs um, uh, in terms of comorbidities and, and other health problems. Um, our second study was in oncology services. And what we carried out was an ethnographic study. So observations, um, conversations with people and also interviews. Um, so the researchers where we were doing the observations were meeting the people, um, the person with dementia and cancer and their family member at the door of the hospital and following them around um, through their appointments, treatments and other experiences um, within the setting. Um, so we got 10 people where we'd got um, a person living with dementia um, who'd taken part in observations and interviews and, and conversations and where we'd looked in their hospital records. And then we got some other people for where we just did observations or where we, we just did interviews but didn't observe. But overall, we've got 17 people with dementia in the study, 22 family members, 19 members of staff across different um, types of role um, working across oncology services. Um, and that gave us 37 different interviews and quite a bit, 46 hours of observations in two different um, trusts. Um, and what we found was... Dementia brought with it, as you might expect, accumulated complexity. So this was about managing two big conditions and the dementia did make a, a significant difference to people. Um, and it, it falls under these um, three areas, um, making decisions about care, involving families um, and other supporters, navigating services, balancing the needs of the person, a sort of person-centred care and the service, which in, in oncology services are very target driven um, and focused on, you know, they've got targets for getting people through, seeing people within a certain amount of time. Um, and then sharing and understanding information. So I've got some quotes that um, explain these a little bit more. Um, just for, for three of these, but the other, other two kind of tie in. Um, so making decisions about care was made much more complicated by having dementia. Um, obviously it was more difficult for clinicians in thinking about what advice to give a person with dementia and their family member around what treatment options were available to them because dementia made it much more complicated in terms of thinking about whether somebody would be able to cope with a surgical outcome. Um, treatment with radiotherapy with chemotherapy and um, for things like having to lie still or, or come to the hospital for multiple appointments for people with dementia and their family members um, they found it much they found it very complicated to understand the information and weigh things up and particularly people with dementia when information was coming kind of fast and was often quite complicated um, they didn't often understand or they would forget afterwards what um, they'd been told so they 
um, needed multiple appointments or reminders um, about what their diagnosis was, what this, the options were. And obviously where people were forgetting that they got a diagnosis or what their treatment options were, that made it more complicated for thinking about um, what was in their best interest for treatment. So we had clinicians saying, you know, we could have a surgical option, for example, for breast cancer. But if this lady doesn't remember that she's had breast cancer and she's going to wake up every day wondering what's happened to her body, is this going to distress her more? So they often had to think through quite complex decisions around what was best um, for the person in, in their individual circumstances. Um, sharing and understanding information was a, a real issue, particularly for clinicians. Um, there was nothing in the records often to say somebody had dementia, so there may be a referral from um, the GP, but it might not say the person had got dementia. The family would assume, oh, sorry, there's uh, somebody coming to knock at my door and my dog's barking. Um, the, um, fam the family members would assume that the person, that the hospital staff had been informed, so they might not mention things. Um, and so there was a lot of working without um, all the information that people needed. The other problem was often staff hadn't had any training. So while the hospital sites had got lots of training for um, staff working in inpatient services, that hadn't filtered through to outpatient services. So people didn't really know much about dementia. Um, and then there was this need to be flexible. So what we saw in oncology services was staff really working quite hard to be person-centred and flexible, even under the conditions of being very target-driven and often having waiting rooms full of people who had to be got through in um, quite rapid um, times to access, um, for example, in radiotherapy departments. But we found staff were really working hard to be flexible and to think about, um, you know, if somebody was better in the morning, then trying to arrange appointments for mornings or afternoons, extending appointments and saying things like, you know, well, if it takes them twice the appointment time to, to have their radiotherapy treatment, well, the people will just have to wait. And, you know, it's important that this person gets um, a good quality care. So we saw them trying to make that balance. Um, so that, that gives you a bit of a flavour, but what I thought you might be more interested in is some of the ways that we started to work to put the findings in practice and, and some of the practical um, things. So we've used the findings um, to make a difference. So we've been sharing those within, um, for example, conferences and webinars and, and journal articles. And um, we're just updating our website for the study, but the um, findings and all the papers and links to them are um, will be on the, the website by the end of the month. Um, we've been using the findings to make a difference in the hospitals. So. Some of the things that the recommendations we made were around making sure information about dementia is recorded um, in the people's records, that information is given clearly and succinctly to people, that diagrams are used and, and information is given in a way that uh, on paper that they can, people can take home and to think about the physical environment and how people can navigate that. Um, so hospitals and particularly oncology departments can be on huge new build sites and they look very nice but they're a nightmare to find your way around all the corridors look the same there's lots of strange looking equipment and so the sites we've been working with we're doing a lot more um, around making their environments dementia friendly thinking about signage um, one of the sites um, had a little bit of money to spend on the environment so they used it to buy chairs of different colours that they could put in the different corridors not only to give people a place to sit um, to have a rest as they're um, finding their way around but they could say what you need to go down is the corridor with the green chairs or the corridor with the purple chairs and so they were kind of markers for wayfinding. Um, another thing that's been a little bit delayed because of Covid but um, they are looking to put into place is areas where people can sit quietly um, and have activities and things to do some magazines and, and jigsaws reminiscence books so they are looking to do that but obviously at the moment you can't have anything <laughs> in environments that multiple people might touch um, so that's obviously been delayed we've also been working um, with the sites to so they're um, one of our sites is working to adapt the Alzheimer's Society this is me document um, to be more suitable for outpatients so they're looking to 
make the questions more suitable for the kind of information that outpatients departments might need in a, a quick, um, quicker format. So it's not so many pages, a couple of sides. Um, and we've also been um, working to do things like, have I got that? You might not have that. So we've been working with Macmillan. Um, they've got some leaflets around cancer and dementia. Um, so we've fed back our findings from the study and they've been fed into that. Um, and so the updated leaflets have all the findings from, from our study in there. So there's a, a booklet for people who've got cancer and dementia and there's um, one for carers as well. Um, we've been writing about it for practitioner journals um, and inputting into dementia training programmes. So somebody who um, is a, a nurse who's involved in Macmillan training around dementia has put some of the findings into the training she's been running um, for Macmillan nurses. One of the other things we were able to do was link the existing expertise within the hospital sites to the oncology team. So in one of the sites, they got a fantastic lead nurse for dementia who'd done great work with the inpatient wards and there was a great program of training but nobody in the oncology department knew she was there um, so they're now linked up and there's a, a, a trust-wide um, dementia program group that are looking to implement dementia improvements right across the trust and that's now got representation from oncology and particularly the radiotherapy department on that to, to bring the um, cancer services into the work that's going on at a, a trust level. Ah, here's the booklet. So those are the cancer and dementia booklets that um, Macmillan have produced that have now got our study findings in. Um, the other one was we were able to feed into the practice guideline for the Society and College of Radiographers for working with people with dementia. So again, the, the findings from our research have been built into the guidance that radiographers have for working with people with dementia. Um, and very quickly, I'll just talk you through um, some of the other studies that we've got in the portfolio around our cancer and dementia work. So it's not just the hospital based oncology work. Um, Molly finished her PhD 18 months ago, looking at the experiences and support needs of carers of people with cancer and dementia. Um, and she, as an outcome of that, she developed a forum site on the Alzheimer's Society um, forum for carers of people with dementia. And there's a specific forum now around cancer and dementia, which um, the people who use it have reported is really helpful for them. We've had Olivia's study looking at um, needs of people in nursing homes. She's just finished and is, is writing up um, her papers from that. And we've got two ongoing studies. So Rebecca's just collecting data at the moment, looking at acute oncology services um, for people with dementia. And Leslie Butterworth works in the Yorkshire Ambulance Service and she's looking at patient transport, which was one of the big challenges around navigating services and getting to and from hospital when people um, had lots of outpatient appointments and the challenges of patient transport turning up three hours before your appointment and then leaving you at the hospital, you know, sitting waiting for three hours and then you've got to wait for another three hours after your appointment for transport to take you home. So what is a 20 minute appointment turns into a full day. So there's a lot that um, they're really keen to do. So we've got those studies um, ongoing at the moment. So that's a whistle stop tour of our sort of cancer and dementia work. The um, cancer and dementia study was funded by NIHR and that's our study team. Um, and if you've got any questions separately or if you want any, any materials or information, that's my email address. Oh, you're muted, Claire. I can't hear you. Thank you for a great presentation. And uh, it just shows what you can achieve when your researchers are linked with a clinical area. But it takes years. I think it has to be said as well. Um, and a nice contrast with Jess's. So Teresa, and now I'll come to you. So welcome, Dr. Corbett. Teresa Corbett from Solent University is a psychologist and has an uh, interest particularly with older people and multiple long-term conditions and we found Teresa because of her work so it's nice to be found that way as well so thank you very much. No problem thank you very much for having me um so I'm going to talk today just let me share my screen and um, let's make sure can everybody see this yep yeah. oh good okay so um I'm going to talk today about um 
a body of work that started when I was working with the um, ARC Wessex at the University of Southampton and Professor Jackie Bridges, amongst others, um, that was looking at um, trying to personalise support for people with multiple long term conditions. And specifically, we were focusing um, on cancer, actually, as well. So it ties in really well, I think, with, with some of the issues that Claire has raised already. Um, I guess that's the thing when you come uh, last in the presentations, you're building on what everybody else has been saying. Um, so I guess, first of all, even without having multiple long term conditions alongside it, a diagnosis of cancer uh, can have a huge impact on people's physical health and their activities, of daily living, their you know, psychological well-being. Um, but we know that um, as people get older, they're, they're more likely to have other conditions to have kind of um, pick them up along the way. Um, but 70% of those living with cancer, living with and beyond cancer are age 65 and older. Um, so it is uh, quite a common, I guess, co-occurring um, condition as people age. Um, and as we've heard from the previous speakers, having multiple conditions can create a lot of um, issues, uh, social, psychological, mental, physical, and can make it quite difficult to manage. And, and that's not any different um, with cancer. Um, and, and again, this will tap into some of the things that Claire has raised uh, alongside dementia. But um, in comparison to people who don't have multiple long term conditions, um, people who have, have those alongside cancer report reduced physical health and well being, decreased quality of life. And there's also this huge issue of um, toxicity and polypharmacy where people are receiving medications um, to treat the, the cancer, maybe sometimes to mitigate side effects, alongside perhaps um, trying to manage um, medications that they're having to, to treat the conditions that they have already. So there's a huge issue of polypharmacy um, and people are at an increased risk of um, things like hospital admission, uh, longer stays in hospital and so on. Um, alongside, um, I guess, uh, perhaps symptoms or, or conditions that we see uh, a lot in older people as well, um, such as frailty, malnutrition or weight loss, those things are again exacerbated by having cancer um, alongside the, just the process of aging, I guess, for many people and, and for, for having multiple conditions. Um, Claire touched a little bit on the kind of the, the social issues, I guess, as well, specifically there about transportation. Um, uh, older people we know are, are at a higher risk of, of, of poverty and social isolation, and this can lead to challenges, things like attending uh, treatments, attending uh, follow up appointments um, and even prioritising which appointments to attend if, if they have um, more than one condition so it, it can complicate everything and even in terms of support and, and self-management at home after treatment and um, the support that they can get with very practical tasks like if they can afford taxis gardeners cleaners and so on that, that can have a huge impact on their quality of life as well um, and one of the things that came up a lot for these individuals that we've spoken to um, over the past few years is about a kind of a confusion um, especially with old age how do you know what symptoms uh, to raise when, how do you know what are symptoms and not just symptoms of, of aging. So as an example, maybe something like cancer related fatigue. Um, so you could have, you know, is that just a normal symptom of aging? Is that to do with heart failure? Is that to do with cancer? How do we know when to um, raise it? How, and which person do you raise it with? if you have lots of people involved in your care so do you raise it with the oncologist do you raise it with your gp or do you just kind of assume that it's something that there's nothing that can be done about and then that again makes it more difficult to help people to manage symptoms like that and also um might lead to delay in reporting symptoms that might um tell us about conditions that are emerging and that, that could be treated earlier and so on so delay in diagnosis as well because of all this, uh, unfortunately, people who have um, multiple conditions alongside cancer have poor survival um, compared to those who have no history of cancer, but also compared to those who don't have other conditions alongside their cancer. So it's, it creates a big, complicated mess of things. Um, as we've spoken about, healthcare uh, has traditionally been this kind of single disease focus, um, which doesn't account for the holistic needs of individuals um, and it kind of creates this siloed fragmented care 
a lot of the time where people might not feel like they know who to go to and um, or what's causing what symptoms. Um, and within that, because it's so symptom focused um, or so disease focused, health service user needs, preferences for treatment, priorities and lifestyle are not at the forefront. It's a very medicalized model. Um, and very much focus on, again, as Claire mentioned about the, the kind of the, the service uh, needs and, and targets a lot of the time. And if we don't understand health service user needs or their priorities, it makes it very difficult to support them. Um, and a lot of the work that we've done is on people who have completed treatment for cancer and are going back out to live in the community. And, um, you know, we spoke to people who would say, uh, you know, it's really important for me to go out for a weekly coffee with a community organization. Um, but I'm not going to take that medication because that um, might uh, make me need to go to the bathroom regularly. I find it difficult to go to the bathroom regularly because of my arthritis. Um, I'm going to prioritise socialising uh, over taking that medication. And then they stop taking the medication, but they never tell anyone about it because it's related to perhaps their heart condition and their arthritis and their social um, isolation. So they don't know who to raise that with. So it can often go, go missed. Um, so if we don't talk to people about what's going on in their lives, it makes it very difficult to tap in to um, what can be done to support them. Um, and I guess alongside that then is this idea that one size does not fit all. People have different needs and priorities and different combinations of conditions, uh, different psychological needs and abilities, different social support networks, as Jessica discussed. Um, so having this, I guess, very... Um, treatment and disease focus uh, just doesn't seem to work for, for people who are now because of advances in treatment and technology are living much longer and accumulating conditions as they age. So um, there's a general kind of, I guess, consensus amongst a, a lot of people that there's a need to move, you know, towards a more comprehensive approach that looks at the cumulative impact of all of these different conditions, not only on the physical health of people, but generally how they're getting on in life in terms of their quality of life. And again, going back to the idea of adding, um, you know, life to those years, not just years to the life. So trying to come up with a solution or trying to improve the situation has been what we were kind of focusing on. Um, and we focused on person-centered care uh, as a, a potential model for this. Um, and that's because when, when we did interviews, um, and again, this taps into the previous speakers as well, when we did interviews with people and we did a qualitative um, review as well, the most important thing to people uh, was being able to do the things that they wanted to do. They wanted to maintain independence um, and the conditions that they prioritized were the ones that interfered or interrupted their lives. Um, and again, that's probably why dementia is, is up there as, as such a prevalent um, um, and important condition. Um, it limits people in some way and then it becomes prioritized. Um, so if, if everyone is, is going to different people for different conditions, they will prioritize the ones and they will prioritize the medications and they will prioritize the self-management strategies that they think um, are, are more likely to support their independence. This might mean that other conditions are not given um, the, the attention that they need or that symptoms are not attended to um, in some ways or that there's confusion about how to manage um, conditions. So it's very important that somebody at some stage uh, can talk to the individual and find out what, what's happening for them. Um, what is the collective impact of the multiple conditions rather than this siloed approach? Um, and this has been identified as a priority um, in the World Health Organization, but also in the NHS uh, long-term plan as well. And this is because there is a body of evidence that suggests that when we look at the values, preferences uh, of older adults, um, they're more likely to get, develop a sense of empowerment, ownership over their healthcare, um, and it can improve uh, their ability to self-manage. And again, this is linked to this idea that if they can raise their concerns and know that they can talk to somebody about, I've got a bit of a niggle here, I'm not sure if this is because of the medication. I'm not sure if this is because of the treatment I've had, but if they can raise it to one in, one person who's looking at them holistically, it makes it more likely that um, things might be picked up on sooner, which leads to fewer emergency admissions, 
uh, decreased utilization of healthcare resources and reductions in delayed diagnosis. Um, and it can also help people to engage. There's kind of a social prescribing element to it as well, I guess, that helps people to engage with uh, services in the community. So beyond healthcare, looking at the social care side of things as well, um, and um, third sector organisations and community um, organisations that can help them, um, because those things we know are important for managing your health as well. So um, it's kind of looking, at, as I say, at a very more holistic approach to healthcare rather than this siloed, fragmented uh, approach uh, that we've traditionally seen. So part of what we did then was we developed this tool called the Chat and Plan. And um, so this was a, a tool that was developed uh, with funding from the ARC Wessex. Um, and it's, I guess, centered on the idea that communication is, is a key feature of person-centered care. I don't have time today to go into the development process in detail, um, but we started with a review of the literature um, we did um, a, a lot of work in terms of psychological principles uh, underpinning the design of this in terms of behavior and, and create a logic model. We created a template and then we took it to two people who would be involved in using this um, in practice. And again, it's just that kind of idea that we have to ask them what do they think about these things because otherwise they will never get implemented or used. Um, so just to show you what it is, it is um, I know this is quite a busy slide, so if you just <laughs> read it from the left across, it's an acronym chat and plan. Um, the first four steps are very much about finding out about how somebody is managing their health, what's going on for them, how are they doing, um, and looking at their health very holistically. Um, it brings in um, ideas like active listening and focuses on identifying priorities and trying to align those priorities with their healthcare needs. Um, and so this process is a kind of, I guess, a scoping exercise. The second part of it is very much the planning, moving to action. It's about prioritizing something to work on together um, with a healthcare professional, laying out an action plan or developing a plan um, with the person um, and maybe their family members if they're there as well, um, agreeing aims and responsibilities. Um, and again, so it's bringing in this idea, this real person-centered approach that it's not just something you're being told to do or something being developed for you. The aim is that it's very much about this shared sense of responsibility and um, healthcare being delivered with you uh, as opposed to to you. Um, and so the idea here is that people would have the opportunity to raise perhaps some of those vague symptoms or their different priorities or, you know, if what they really want to do is to be able to continue living independently gardening, keeping their dog, whatever it is, is there something that can be done to support them to do that if they're lonely, if they need support, maybe financial assistance and so on. So it's it's kind of covering all of those elements and, and allowing a space for somebody to raise any of those concerns. So when we rolled this out, we, we wanted to get views on on it from the healthcare professionals and the older adults, as well as some family members. Um, generally, they liked the non-clinical approach to it. Um, and the staff that we spoke to from a range of professions um, that work with um, older adults, they thought that the structure might help to routinize and formalize practice, uh, noting that a lot of the time, this is something that people develop over time and they see as being important, but that maybe uh, less experienced staff might not recognize as being really key to tap into. Um, they didn't want another tick box form to fill in another assessment, but they felt that if it could be linked into something that they're doing already, maybe embedded within their clinical pattern um, to structure a consultation, then it might work really well. And um, th they acknowledged that they wanted to prioritize individuals' needs and values. But ultimately, um, there was a lot of discussion about how do you ensure service user safety above all else? And how does the staff, how does staff know when they should be giving advice, maybe to do with mental health, for example, or at what point would they refer on? So that was a question that they raised. They felt that anyone with the appropriate skills could potentially deliver it, but um, the training might be required to support it and that's something I'll touch on again um, one of the brilliant things about this is when you're piloting you're just kind of bringing an idea together that's based very much on academic research and then bringing it to them they can suggest changes one of the things that we found is that we had a lot of goal setting in the original 
um, version of this and that the older adults that we spoke to really didn't like the term goals, which we found very interesting. They felt that it was too kind of achievement focused um, and wasn't something that reflected their experiences. So we changed the terms throughout to things like targets or just something to work on. And I think testing those little things are really important because if um, if people aren't going to kind of get on board with the language that you're using, something will, will never um, succeed um, in, in what you're trying to achieve. In terms of challenges then, as I mentioned, people didn't want this, you know, tick box exercise where they kind of go through it. Um, and they, they found that something really frustrating. Oh, is this going to be another assessment that we have to do? We don't have time to be nursing paper, not people, um, was a quote that came up. Um, some, some of them felt that they hadn't been trained in this way at all, that although they recognised it was a priority for the NHS, that they hadn't been trained in this non-directive approach, that they had been uh, trained with a very uh, problem-focused um, approach to care um, and they, they felt that they would like to be able to do it but didn't really feel confident didn't feel like they had the skills um, and they felt that maybe some of the skills were just something that people have naturally and that that, that they might not have had or something that they develop with experience so again although um, this was a tool that we developed it was interesting to hear just perspectives on person-centered care in general and barriers to implementing person-centered care beyond this tool um, they were afraid of the kind of the active listening side of things as well, the fear of opening a Pandora's box and what if you couldn't do anything about the things that were being raised um, and what effect that that might have on them and their mental health and what supports were in place for them. They had concerns about goal setting as well. They felt that that was something that maybe physiotherapists could do really well, but wasn't something maybe that they um, could do um, as part of the regular practice. And as I say, we were talking to people within secondary care in hospital roles, um, but also people working in primary care. So across the board, that was something that came up that goal setting might be quite difficult. There was also the argument that we do this already um, and perhaps some of them do. However, a lot of the literature would suggest that people might do some of it some of the time um, in some situations if they have the time. Um, and even that came up in our interviews as well, that people said, I think I might, you know, sometimes ask people how they are, but I don't do anything about it and things like that as well. So I think that it would be a challenge um, to, to uh, in trying to promote something like this for some members of staff, they might think that they're, we're teaching them to suck eggs. So moving forward with this, as I say, this is very kind of exploratory to a certain extent. Um, we know who the interventions and tools of this are very difficult to integrate into practice. And that's why working with the people who would potentially be using it uh, was key. Well, we use the person-based approach to intervention development. Um, I'd be happy to talk to anybody about that if they wanted to know more, but it's very much centered on lots of qualitative research, lots of user testing, refining, coming back, asking people their views on modified versions and so on. And as I say, this was originally designed for people uh, in community settings um, who have cancer alongside multiple conditions. But a lot of the time when we were talking to people, they were saying, you know, I work uh, with people with COPD. I, I, I don't see how this is any different. We could use this there as well. So I'd be very interested to see how this could be rolled out and um, maybe with other groups as well. So as I say, we're, we're um, currently um, looking at, at ways to potentially use this in practice. Um, I don't think it would uh, necessarily need to be a standalone um, tool. It could be used as, as part of something, which it's currently being uh, used as part of an evaluation with the Wessex Cancer Alliance. Um, it's been incorporated into personalised care and support planning. So again, just into training. Um, so it's not this thing that people must do, hasn't been formally tested as an intervention, um, but it is something I would definitely like to explore uh, moving forward. At the moment, I'm working with the Centric team part-time at the University of Southampton as well. And we're looking at trying to figure out the best way to personalise care across the cancer trajectory. And definitely a lot of the learning that we have um, gained from doing this study is informing um, a, a lot of the, of the ideas that are emerging there as well. Um, so as I say, we want to look to maybe apply for funding and develop this further, further maybe look at training um, staff or, or challenging some of those um, um, issues in terms of self-efficacy or clinician empowerment and so on, and maybe the skill sets behind that. Um, as, as, as I say, this is a priority for the NHS. So it is 
um, a problem that people feel like they can't do it. Um, and also, as I say, um, we are very interested in looking to explore it with people with other conditions, um, multiple conditions in general or specific conditions. So maybe even things like dementia um, as well. Um, because I think I think it would be important to explore it further um, as well. So if anybody would like to get in touch about that, please do let me know. Um, my contact details are here and I have included a slide at the end. So these will be circulated with some of the references of the studies. And we are just currently analysing um, the qualitative, well, analysing again to, to publish the, the qualitative data from the healthcare professionals about this. And I think that'll be a really important paper to um, discuss the barriers and the challenges to implementing person-centered care in practice. So thank you very much and that's all for me. Thank you so much. So we've had three uh, quite uh, complementary uh, presentations, I think all of which have started with the issues but also have begun to point towards solutions and uh, so um, I, having a look, I, we don't we have one um, question, but I wondered if I could um, start really with the um, this idea of continuity over time and in terms of how we've talked about the older person experiencing and having different expertise in different situations, but I just wondered how one saw continuity from the um, healthcare provider's point of view, because I was thinking, Teresa, your chat and plan or cancer care is now for a lot of people, cancer is a chronic condition as well. And obviously dementia is a long term condition. Um, and it's just how does if any of your studies highlight uh, continuity, because of, historically that would have always been the GP, but that is much harder to achieve with the current pressures. And I don't know if I'll throw it open to any of you as to whether in talking through if your findings identified key people or if moving forward um, there were obvious people. Teresa, do you want to go first? Yes, then... yeah. um, so I guess one of the interesting things that we found is already, although we had focused a lot of the research on people with cancer and multiple conditions, um, for a lot of them, cancer wasn't, if, if they had finished treatment for cancer, cancer wasn't the predominant condition that they focused on, that it wasn't, it was something that they still saw as an acute thing that had been treated and they had moved on and uh, their focus was back on, as, as I said, the kind of debilitating conditions, arthritis that stopped them doing what they wanted to do. Um, but in saying that, they really appreciated the, the cancer care approach that has long-term follow-ups um, and that kind of idea that I don't have to worry about it because there's an appointment there that's, that I will go to in six months time, in a year's time. Um, and they liked that. And they, I don't think they felt that they had that kind of follow-up care for perhaps the more long-term conditions that they just live with every every day in the community. Okay. So that's just in comparison. So yeah, I see you nodding. Do you want to come in? Is that me? You would talk? Yeah, uh, we found the same. Um, I think one of the things people noted was how everything sort of all kicked off when you got a cancer diagnosis and there were lots of resources and everything moved quickly. You got a clinical nurse specialist who looked after you and you could you got a phone number for them that you could contact them at any point. And they contrasted that to their dementia diagnosis, which was like, yeah, you've got dementia, come back and see us in six months unless anything gets worse. And so they kind of felt really abandoned um, with their dementia diagnosis and very looked after with the cancer diagnosis but I think the problem was they didn't feel the two often talked to each other and so it was a rare occasion where maybe the oncology um, consultant would contact the dementia team to ask if there are any potential contraindications around medications or things but really they felt that neither really um, took into consideration the other um, as well as they could but I think the clinical nurse specialists really tried to do that and they were a real linchpin in that continuity um, of care but once people were back in the community it was more challenging and often they were if they'd been in for surgery and discharged they were sometimes discharged without all the right information so I think it was quite variable really in terms of continuity of care and where they'd been in that sort of system for cancer treatment well, the outpatient services were certainly seen as very positive. So, I mean, are you suggesting that maybe the dementia specialist has to go to the service? 
what you know I was just sort of thinking that back in the day when palliative care was new the idea was that everybody would understand palliative care as part of the trajectory of care as not everybody will be cured yeah. but now it is you bring in your palliative care specialist don't you when I think it's a bit of both I think the oncology clinicians need to know enough about dementia to be able to sort of work with the basics and and to be able to understand how dementia might impact on treating cancer and people's care needs but they need to have access and, and I think that's the other problem with the system we've got now people are diagnosed with dementia they're within usually within memory assessment services mainly until if they get medication it's stable and then they're discharged back to GP so actually nobody's really looking after the dementia side of things um, so I think that's a fall between the gaps. Who, who do you contact if you're not quite sure about somebody's medications? Because often the GP just goes, well, I'm just prescribing what I've been told by the memory service. I don't, you know, I've, I've just got prescribing and roles. So I think people do fall between the gaps because we don't have that continuity of care in dementia care with specialists who look after people, um, which is a big problem. Jess, do you have a comment as well from your, I was thinking of your diet and the people. Together. Yeah, um, well, I think it relates to sort of the themes around how people like curated supportive professional networks. And in one of my case studies, um, somebody had lived with uh, chronic myeloleukemia for like um, 16 years. Um, so they had a really close relationship with their oncologist. Um, and then shortly after they went into remission for that, they got their dementia diagnosis. So there were actually some communications between the oncologist and the neurologist. Um, but um, yeah, I mean, that sort of relationship was formed over time, like the um, Claire and Teresa said, because cancer was the prominent condition, they developed that continuity of care with the professional. But in that case, I think because they had that personal relationship, it kind of then followed on to their experience of dementia, especially with the family carer. He seemed to have a really close relationship with those professionals, which then facilitated the care. Whereas if you haven't sort of got that, relationship with a healthcare professional then that's when it can become more yeah fragmented okay, thank you now i've got two questions here i've got one from um uh, asking who is the so this will be for teresa who is the tool designed for in terms of staff groups yes yeah, so we actually wanted to look at it i guess this was very exploratory and we wanted to look at it across a huge range of people and one of the questions we asked them was where would this sit? If this was going to happen, who would do it? Who would have the time to do it? And um, so it wasn't designed for anyone in particular. Um, but I think the general consensus was that this would be something that people thought would work better maybe in primary care um, because of the kind of focus on the, the holistic side of things um, the time and the space to have those conversations. Um, a, a lot of the, the, the CNSs, for example, that we spoke to felt that they just had so much to do almost with the firefighting in the hospital that they wouldn't have had time and even space, a room within the hospital to, to have a conversation like this. So they felt that um, there, that maybe somebody in primary care or um, there was, a, you know, we spoke to people in kind of frailty teams as well, and, and they thought it be, could be something that they could do. But I guess ultimately somewhere in the community was, was the, the punchline of all that. But it was very interesting to hear the different views um, they felt in terms of skills that, that technically anyone who had the skills could, could do it. It's an interesting idea that everybody was suggesting there was somebody else out there to do it, which um, is a little bit too common, I think. Um, I've got also a question asking um, about care homes, actually. And I was just wondering, did any of you include people in care homes in the management of multiple long-term conditions? But I think I, I was very struck, Claire, that your description fitted an awful lot of what we already know about the care home population. I don't know whether you included those. We had one, per, so we didn't exclude people who were in care homes. Um, so we just had one person in the, the CANDEM study who was in a care home, but obviously we've got um, Liv's PhD, which I can mention briefly, which was in nursing homes. Um, so the person who was in the care home, um, it was quite complex because the problem was he was coming to hospital for, um, he got prostate cancer and he was due to have radiotherapy every weekday for two uh, for four weeks. And the care home said, we cannot afford to send a staff member with him every day because he'll have to go on patient transport. And so that's like at least half a day out of a staff member's time. He didn't have any family members. 
he had a social worker who managed to go with him for his first appointment but then was told by his manager he wasn't allowed to do that because that wasn't funded in their time um so he then went around and went and said it's a health thing the hospital went that's not our problem we, you know we provide the service but it's not our job to get him here um go to primary care primary care said no this is secondary care and so in the end they they managed to work the social workers like, i'm going to take him a couple of times and not tell anybody else it's a visit and then the other rest of the time a very senior nurse from the oncology team sat with him on his arrival so he, they got him safely on the patient transport who knew and took him down to the oncology department and delivered him to the hands of a senior nurse who sat with him the whole time they juggled the waiting around so that they could get him in as quickly as possible and she sat with him until he went back to the care home so without their flexibility that would never have happened so that was I think an example of um, we're talking about the important role of relatives as well. You know, somebody without relatives fell through the gaps. Um, but Liv's PhD found that the challenge in care homes is people are often so frail. There's a decision made usually with the GP and the um, family members that if somebody's got a suspected cancer, they often make a decision not to refer to specialist oncology services to get a sort of formal diagnosis so people live in the care home with a clinical diagnosis of probable cancer but that means they're cared for by their GP and the care home without any specialist input um, so you can see why they don't want people to go to the hospital if they're frail and might not cope with that and invasive things um, happening but then they don't get that specialist input that you would get from oncology services um, so there's there's quite a bit to think about there around how we do get specialist cancer care for symptom management to people um, who may not go for a formal diagnosis. And I suppose I'm quite struck by how hidden all of that is, that you only realise it when you have a particular mm -hmm. individual to bring it to the fore. But these, because that was one of my questions was who gets to decide how to adapt in the Chatham plan and also in Jess's study was that if the person is saying I really think this is what's most important to me um, in terms of quality of life and health related quality of life but then who has the it comes back to how do you have the clinician who makes the decision which overrules another specialty even to say this is what matters to the person I don't know if you've got any examples of that no in, in my study, it was more related to the family carer side of things. So, um, you know, it had an example in my secondary analysis, examples of both a, a, a home care worker and a um, healthcare professional being like, this person with dementia shouldn't really be doing physiotherapy because they're not benefiting from it, it relies on memory, like they're not getting anything out of it. But the family carer really wants them to have the physiotherapy, possibly because it's at least they're doing something rather than nothing almost like that idea so again like two services saying or well, maybe they shouldn't be doing it but the family care being like no I want them to have it so um you know that opinion sort of outweighing all the others and then how do how just yeah like you say I don't know what the solution is but yeah definitely um came across that in an example <laughs> I mean, there is an inequalities theme, I think, threading through all these three presentations. I've got some very specific questions, and I just wonder if it would be quite nice to, and somebody's actually, uh, Gemma here has said, what a massive health inequality. Uh, yeah, I would agree. So, Rebecca, you've, Rebecca Golding, you've raised a very specific point. I just wondered if you wanted to share some of your ex experience, because one of the this is partly hearing some presentations, but also hearing about people who have joined the, the webinar. So if you do feel free to contribute, Rebecca. Hi, yeah. Um, so I, I posted another question for Teresa. I think we've uh, been in touch before because I use the person-based approach as well. Um, so I did some work to develop an intervention to empower older people with multiple long-term conditions. Um, to change the way they communicate with staff in primary care. Um, so yeah, my question was really around like the intervention you developed, the chat and plan seemed to be very staff focused. And I wondered if there was any sort of consideration at any point of developing a, a patient focused side of things. And also I guess beyond this meeting, if 
you've done a staff side and I've done a patient side, it might be interesting to get together and talk about that. Okay. Yeah, so, so the idea it was, so we did um, show it to p older people as well and got them to critique it and got them to talk about had they ever gotten the chance to have a conversation like this before. And um, most of them said no. And um, did they feel like they would like to? Uh, and some of them said, you know, oh, I don't know if I, you know, I'm <coughs> happy to trust, you know, the, the doctor's opinion and things like that. And um, so we did definitely involve them in it. And the idea is that although um, the conversation, I guess, would be initiated um, by the staff, it is very much intended to be something that would be um, involving the, the person um, in the conversation and, and kind of enabling them um, and empowering them and giving them the space to, to speak up. Um, one of the things that did come up was conversations about health literacy um, ability to communicate um, and even things, you know, like hearing problems and just creating that space to involve people more. So I guess the idea is, is this isn't an intervention that's done with people. It's more kind of a, a, a support for staff and clinicians to to have those conversations so yeah I definitely think there's a lot of overlap there but uh, yeah we did we did involve them we, we interviewed people and um as I as I mentioned very briefly that the idea of things like goal setting they just absolutely hated the term and and it came up consistently and um, so things like that were really valuable for us to hear that if if all the clinicians are coming in and going let's set some goals that they're just kind of going you know, I'm the expert in my, in my experience. You don't know us like I don't have goals. My goal is to, you know, live for another few years by myself. That's not, you know, anything to do with this. So um, but yet they were involved, but it's it's a shared, a shared tool, hopefully. Yeah, I, I am struck by the overlap with a lot of interventions. So we're we're doing a pre-frailty trial, which is asking people to set what they what they would like to do. And it may just be walk to the shops and then everything that goes to achieve that it is the, the clinical input, but it's it's not as goals. So Liz Waters, you have a question, you have an observation about social prescribing and sort of saying that's sort of meant to address. I don't know if you're happy to contribute or actually comment further. Yes, there. Oh, sorry, hi. Yeah, there you um, are. Hi. Yeah, so I mean, I'm from the opposite end of the spectrum, really. I've always worked, I've worked with people with long term conditions over the years, um, but from the sort of the social welfare perspective and worked quite, um, quite a lot with social prescribers. And I think one of the, the biggest frustrations that sort of we see with long term conditions is obviously that lack of link up between, you know, kind of clinical HCPs and to sort of, you know, the the, the community organizations that are here to support and that, that lack of sort of in, interconnect um sort of not much intersection that happens between between them all um and I know that obviously social prescribing was set up to be able to look at that and I think the frustration for me is that obviously those pathways just aren't quite there yet that um for, for a patient to be able to access social prescribing involves a whole conversation with a GP much of the time um, and that conversation, obviously, as we know, with a lot of people, particularly with older generation, they don't tend to have that time with the GP anyway, um, tend to avoid it. So those referrals often don't happen. Um, so it was really just just I suppose just an observation about that and really what we can do to see that. I think quite often and I hope I apologize for the generalization, but quite often what I see, particularly from uh, consultants is uh, I think probably a view that social care is not their responsibility, that it's a nice to have, um, you know, kind of anything supportive in the community and that, you know, it's very much the medical model, um, which is obviously sort of problematic for that holistic model of care. So, yeah, just an observation, really. Yeah, so thank you. Thank you for being to talk. Um, um, I, I think it is, there is a danger with our research of, of being clearer and clearer about the problem. And, but less able to discuss the implementation. So, I mean, I think it was heartening to see both Jess's future plans, but also Claire's conversations and Teresa's reconfiguring. And I am wondering if we can exploit the ARC network because I'm aware that there are similar things being done in palliative care with Morag Farker talking about what's important to you and, and pre-planning and so on. And just whether we can look at some broader implementation solutions to take forward. Vicky Davis, you have a question about dementia navigators. Are you happy to talk or shall we expand on that if you're still with us? 
Yeah, I'm still here. Yeah, what? Well, I mean, do you want to say yourself about how you see Dementia Navigators? Uh, it, it's just an observation. I think we've been talking about Dementia Navigators for quite a long time. I'm sure I've seen it in some of the nice guidelines somewhere. It's having that one person the go-to person who can do that linking, that facilitating between the healthcare professionals, the social care, you know, the third sector. And I know it, it's, it's of primary importance to get that consistency because obviously when you're dealing with families, uh, I mean, I work with families where both partners of, of, of you know, are living with dementia and they might not have any family members and then they're missing appointments and all sorts of things. So a dementia navigator who could liaise with all the other specialists, you know, see the assets would be a solution. Be a very highly skilled job. So that was a statement. It wasn't a question. Was it? <laughs> <laughs> and, that's fine and 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 i spoke and but i i'm i'm old enough to know that every specialty wants its own special person to navigate them their other services and um you know and, and somehow we have to navigate around that one as well um and i've got deborah robinson you're saying do you want to contribute or is this more an observation it was um, actually an observation, but um, I, I've dealt with quite a few social prescribers and I work in the voluntary and charity sector. Um, th some of them are very limited by the contracts that they hold and they can't actually do anything for a patient unless that GP referral allows them, which kind of defeats the object of social prescribing. So we have this we have this issue of where the so hopefully the evidence is a good lever is to say well you it, that can't continue isn't it is what you're saying because I think Claire's yes. illustration was another classic example of everybody knowing what was needed but nobody being able to within the the setup of the services being able to do it in a straightforward way it was workarounds. Um, yeah. Yes, and I think it's important that the people out in each area understand the services in their area, because educating the public is of prime importance, and the all your presentations have explained that. Um, you know, it's no good just leaving pa patients, service users, carers, etc., in the dark, because they need to understand all this, and many of them don't. But I suppose this is my question. Growing on that is, but didn't you find that quite a lot of your participants were very knowledgeable about health services just because they'd lived with their different conditions and could differentiate between what was a good service and not? No? No? Experts by experience, I think, is the, uh, the adult social care uh, title given to many individuals who have, who have handled uh, those situations but the, the thing is that their, their feedback is extremely important and particularly for the studies that you're all doing extremely important mm, i agree i agree so any further comments on implementation so we've, we've we've clearly articulated the issue we've clearly articulated possible solutions any more just reflections on. on the actual implementation and application just to pick up on something that kind of Claire mentioned, um, one of the things that surprised me was when we were doing this research, how often the things that were done to support people were just champions, people spending extra time, people putting in the extra effort, as opposed to it being something that was embedded in practice. So the idea of the, the staff just kind of take, taking their own time to go and help somebody to get to the hospital. And I think I think that's that's one of the big biggest problems. Um, people are are stretched, and if you're relying on on the the heroes and the claps and things, it's 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 going to be very difficult to to implement and make the kind of continued improvements. Um, it's really difficult to to continue re relying on on very good people giving their own time. So I think it's it's that's one of the things that that really needs to be addressed. It can't be as ad hoc as that. Okay. I think the other challenge is evaluating implementation because you, when you get the kind of studies that we're doing when you start to explore things and then you've got um, interventions that you put into place it, they're really difficult things to 
actually value it if you've got it's kind of a complex intervention if you're doing a, a short version of this is me and you're extending appointments to make them a bit longer and you've put some signage up and you've trained your staff how do you evaluate that to make a case that other people then need to do it because everybody wants to well does you know we we all want the evidence that these things make a difference before we're going to put them into practice but often that could you know, cumulative effect of a number of small things is really difficult to evidence that it, it makes a difference because often it's not measurable stuff. You can't do it in a well-being measure or, a you know, the satisfaction measures. Are. So I think that's the challenge we've got as well. A lot of the implementation stuff and the, the things we've been doing is very much on individuals with enthusiasm looking at what they what needs to be done in their service and doing things in quite a sort of tailored way but that's reliant on enthusiasm and, and individuals and I think that's always a challenge where you, you've got these types of things where it's not an intervention that you can do an RCT or something on that <laughs> fits the usual model of um, what healthcare wants to um, to take on board interventions on a wider or changes on a wider basis. That could segue nicely into a webinar on communities of practice where, you, you're where you're changing the whole culture as part of taking your evidence to make it fit. Um, so are there any more questions that have come up? No, I think we are coming to a natural end. We have, I would just like to use the time we will be sending you the link to the presentation and the recording. Some people have asked for the recording as well. And well, with that will come um, an evaluation form. It's tempting to send you the evaluation form and then release the, the <laughs> but that would be not in the spirit of sharing knowledge, but we would really like to uh, have your uh, feedback on, on what you took from this. It's a great range of people. I've recognized lots of names from researchers, practitioners, people living with dementia, family carers. And so, uh, you know, this is in a way a, a, an interesting community of people listening, but, um, but please do provide us with feedback of, of what you would like. I would like to congratulate the speakers, both for their clarity of presentation, but also the minimal abbreviations. There were a few, but I think you did incredibly well, because um, again, this is an area where there are multiple um, uh, abbreviations and shortcuts in how we talk about uh, the challenges for older people. Um, and it's just been an absolute pleasure to chair this, and it's uh, great how your uh, presentations have dovetailed and sort of built on each other. But it's also highlighted, I think, about that there are some core system issues that you are highlighting where these are exemplars of things that the health service is wrestling with at lots of different for people with lots of different conditions. Thank you to everybody. A mark of a good webinar is that you haven't lost half <laughs> halfway through. And actually, people have stayed with us all the way. So thank you for that, too. And that's great. And please do keep on our mailing list and we will be in touch with the links to the slides recording and crucially the evaluation so thank you very much and please do send queries to our individual speakers as well thank you very much